Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning just thanking you for today that you have granted. We thank you for the blessed Sabbath and we thank you that you have given to us instruction that we can learn. And as we learn today, I pray that this learning will be a means of helping us each one to come up higher, to draw closer to you, and to be fitted up for that kingdom above. Guide us and keep us now is our prayer. We pray these things in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we've been on the study of health, and we're going to continue with that study today. And their title is The Gospel of Health. The Gospel of Health. And I have a short sentence that I'm going to start out with here that just gives us a lot to think about. And it says, we will not have a right understanding of the subject of temperance until we consider it from a Bible standpoint. Amen. We will not have a right understanding of the subject of temperance until we consider it from a Bible standpoint. And we're going to do that today. But before we head into the Bible, I want to share with you this reference. This is from a publication, um, Unpublished Testimonies, um, Spalding and McGann's um, Unpublished Testimonies. This, is, this was dated August 30, 1896. August 30, 1896, and it says, The need of healthful habits is a part of the gospel, which must be presented to the people by those who hold forth the word of life. The importance of the health of the body is to be taught as a Bible requirement. The importance of the health of the body is to be taught as a Bible requirement. And so, our health is directly related to our salvation. It is a requirement of God that we present our bodies a living, not half-dead sacrifice. The quote goes on and says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, writes Paul, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one member of another. Romans 12, 1 to 5. So, it truly is our responsibility and our job to understand that health is a Bible requirement. And as I've been studying this week, I didn't have this study, this sermon put together until actually I started it last evening. But all through the week, I have been doing lots of reading in spare moments and coming to a realization 
that is kind of staggering. And that realization is simply that my health is directly related, or maybe I should say my health or my lack of health, of good health, is directly related to actions that I have done. So what I'm, what I'm, to narrow that down a little bit more, what I'm telling you is, whether you are sick or well, whether you are healthy and strong or feeble, it is your responsibility. And it is caused by what you have done. Now, there are some things that we have inherited from our gene pool. But for the most part, if we would have known, and this is the key point, if we would have known when we were young that there's things that we can do so that we could overcome those weak points, and there wouldn't be any reason at all why we would have any health issues at all. So let's go on here and we'll give we'll expound on this thought a little bit more. But ultimately I'm going to put it first person with me. It is the things that I have done, the choices I have made, whether it was things I ate, whether it was my lack of exercise or whether it was my overwork or whether it was any other thing about or surrounding me, the clothing I chose to wear or not wear or all of these other points, these are the things that have caused me to have the issues that I have with my health. Back to Spaldingham again, page 41, paragraph 1, it says, and literally, where this is at is we started out with this Spalding McGann, page, um, page 40, paragraph 8, uh, the, about uh, the importance of the health of the body is taught as a Bible requirement. And she quoted Romans 12, 1 to 5. And then following that, she states, this is a sermon which needs to be presented to the people. What is? Health. Health. Romans Chapter 12, verse 1, By the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. The question, back to our quote, The question of health reform is not agitated as it must be. Well, I'm probably a very feeble one to be doing this, but I'm going to do my best. The question of health reform is going to get agitated today. And I will state this, and that is, there is something called a skinny sinner, just like a fat sinner. Because usually, okay, usually we understand bad health as being overweight. Anybody who has bad health has too much weight. And I'm telling you, there are skinny sinners. I'll give you an example of that if I remember later on. I don't want to do it at this point. But there's, there are skinny sinners just like there are fat ones. So just because... A person may be 30 pounds underweight doesn't mean that they're free from sin or that they're not guilty for their sins just like the person who may be 30 pounds overweight. The question, back to our quote, the question of health reform is not agitated is that it must be and will be. A simple diet, and listen carefully to this next part of the sentence, a simple diet and entire abstinence of drugs 
leave nature free to recuperate the wasted energies of the body. Now, don't take me wrong. I'm not saying throw all your drugs in the toilet and flush them down. If some of you did that, you might just end up in an insane asylum. So I'm not telling you to just dump, be done, get rid, etc. But what I am saying to you is that if we're truly following God's plan, we'll come to the point where we can do that. Where we can get rid of and go to a point where we, there is entire abstinence of drugs. Now let me read this sentence and can keep going here. It says, a simple diet and the entire abstinence of drugs, leaving nature free to recuperate the wasted energies of the body. The intellect and the moral energies of Christians need to be awakened. Let's go to our Bibles. We want to go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20. And it says, For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We're bought with a price. That means we don't own ourselves. It's not our choice, really. God has given us requirements. Let's go on. Spalding and began. Um, unpublished testimonies. Page 41, paragraph 4. Nearly all the members of the human family eat more than the system requires. Nearly all. Nearly all. Eat more than the system requires. This excess decays and becomes a putrid mass. So because of our overeating, we have this excess that becomes a putrid mass in our systems. Now, again, I want to say, please, let's be temperate about what we do. I'm not telling everybody that you can't eat anymore because that's just as bad as if you eat too much. Be, be rational, be reasonable. But what, I'm, what it is saying here is that the majority overeat from what we're being told. Now, listen closely to this. It says, after this, the excess, um, this excess decays and becomes a putrid mass. Catarrhal difficulties, kidney disease, headache, and heart troubles are the result of immoderate eating. And I went, okay, kidney disease, yeah, I understand that. Headache, okay, got that one. Heart troubles, yeah, got that one, understand that. Did you realize heart troubles can be caused by overeating? Yeah, very, very simply. Uh, all you got to do is gain a lot of extra weight, put a lot of extra fat around the heart. Now the heart doesn't have as room to go lub-dub, okay? But what is catarrhal? And I believe I'm pronouncing it right. And I thought, I'm going to look that up. I think it means lung disorders, but I'm going to look it up just to see. So I looked it up in the 1828 dictionary. Katara. Katara. A deflection or increased secretion of mucus from the membranes of the nose. Um, the fauces, uh, which is part of the throat, and the bronchi, with fever, sneezing, cough, thirst, lassitude, loss of appetite, 
and sometimes an entire loss of taste, called also a cold chlorenza or epidemic catara is called influenza. So, catarrhal difficulties, or let's put it in something that's more we use, an increase of secretions of mucus from the nose, um, coughing, sneezing, lung issues, loss of appetite, loss of taste, um, influenza, the flu, is what catarrh is. So, she's telling us here that when we get the flu, putting it in simple terms, or we get kidney diseases or headaches or heart troubles, it's usually related to the fact of immoderate eating. Wow. Okay. Most of you have known me. Here's time for me to start fessing up. You've all seen me go for the Kleenex box. And, yeah, I sprayed mold. And I believe that's part of it. But, here again, it still comes back to it. It's my fault. And the reason it's my fault is I didn't do diligence to find out that it was dangerous to spray mold without a respirator. So, the problem still comes back to it. It's my fault that I have this issue. And it might just be the fact that I eat too much. My wife's smiling and nodding her head yes. So we're going to help each other. Let's go on with this quote. If more food, even of a simple quality, is placed in the stomach, then the living machinery requires this surplus becomes a burden. The system makes desperate efforts to dispose of it. And this extra work causes a tired, weary feeling. Some who are continually eating call this all-gone feeling hunger. But it is caused by the overworked condition of digestive organs. So I want to share right now what I mentioned earlier. Because it says the system makes up desperate efforts to dispose of it. And this, this extra work causes a tired, weary feeling. Every ever heard of a disease called chronic Fatigue. Chronic fatigue. I have seen it, been around it numerous times. We had a man, we had some people actually that called us one time. And they said, we have a friend who has chronic fatigue in an extreme way. And we want to know if we can bring him to your house because he's been all over and nobody can help him. He's been to doctors. He's been to naturopaths. He's been to all kinds of different health centers. And nobody seems to be able to help him. Will you try to help him? And we said yes. We can't make any promises. We're not miraculous healers by any stretch. And so he came. And we sat down to the dinner table. I think it wasn't long after they got there. Melanie had fixed up a meal. And they kind of settled in with their, their trailer. And we sat down to a meal. And... I hadn't, I, if I'd read this quote, I wasn't, didn't remember it then, but we knew shortly we were able to diagnose him within a couple of hours. Because we sat down for our afternoon meal. And we ate. And I ate, a, I would say, a large amount. 
But interestingly enough, this man, gentleman polished off in the time that I ate my plate of food, he'd polished off two. And so I'm still sitting there at the table because he was still finishing his plate, I thought. And in reality, he sat there and cleaned everything up. There wasn't, a, he ate four or five plates of, Melanie saying, five huge plates of food. And then he goes, is that, and I mean, I'm talking, I'm working hard labor on a ranch at that time. A lot of physical strength required from it. This guy had been riding for hours and hours and hours. They just traveled halfway across the country to come there. And I watched him and I talked to Melanie after he went out to his trailer because when he finished finally, Melanie said, no, that's all. I don't have anything else prepared. We'll have to fix something um, for, for breakfast. And he kind of left grumbling. And I said, well, pretty quick here. I've got to get back out to work, but would you like to come to, I can take you around, show you a little bit. And he goes, no, no, he, I'm feeling really tired. I'm just, I'm really exhausted. He says, wow, he says, I'm really feeling, just really feeling low. He says, hopefully you guys can help me, but I'm just really low. He says, I, I think I'd better go out to the trailer and get just rest, he says. And literally, there was a short little walk up our drive to where the trailer was parked because he couldn't get it down into our drive. And I didn't think he was going to make it up there. He was so fatigued by the time he got to his trailer. And yeah, this man was only probably, I don't know, he was probably 10 years younger than we were at that time, something like that. He was just a young man. I, I would say 30s, 30-ish, mid-30s, something like that, or a little, maybe even a little less. Anyway, point being, after Melanie and I talked about it, we realized... His problem, we couldn't help unless we could convince him to eat less because his problem was eating. He was so overloading his body that he couldn't, his body just, oh yes, and that was the other thing. Matt reminded me of something that I almost forgot to say. So you would think this man would weigh 500 pounds and be monstrous big. No. No. He was probably 20 or 30 pounds underweight. He was so skinny. And I asked the people that had brought him, I said, by chance, after he eats, does he like throw up or anything? And they're like, no, no, we've never, ever, ever seen him throw up. But he was just pencil thin, just bone thin. I mean, he just looked like a rack of bones. So that's what I say, there are skinny sinners and fat sinners. And his chronic fatigue problem was directly related to his health and sad to, or to his fork. And sad to say, we tried to work with him and get him to realize what he was doing to himself. And he was not interested. He left as sick as he came. Okay, going on. Spalding began, page 43, paragraph 3. The sin of the Noadic world, that would be Noah's time, the Noadic world was intemperance, and today this sin exhibited by intemperance in eating and drinking is so marked that God will not always tolerate it. Do you realize this is partly why the flood came, was because of the intemperance of mankind. This is the same thing that happened with the Sodom and Gomorrah. This is the same thing happened with Job's children. And this is the same thing that's going to happen again. Going on. By eating and drinking we sustain life. And in themselves, if kept within the bounds of temperance, remember the definition of temperance that we learned last week, 
they are of no harm. Temperance, by the way, just in case you missed it, is using moderately that which is, a, is good and abstaining from evil. Or moderation is just using everything moderately. For instance, it's okay to have some alcohol. It's okay to, to have a cheeseburger once in a while. Just don't do it too often. That's moderation. Or gorge and fast, gorge and fast. All of those things are related. So what we're talking about here is using, abstaining from that which is evil and using moderately that which is good. That's temperance. So if within the bound of temperance, they are of no harm, that is the diet, but a blessing. But when eating and drinking are carried to excess, they come under the head of intemperance. 1 Corinthians 3.17 If any man, defi any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Now this is serious stuff. And I know I've shared, I've done health talks before, and I've had people argue with me, what I eat is not salvational. Well, 1 Corinthians 3.17 says that it is. If any man destroy the temple of God, what is the temple of God? It is our bodies. So if I destroy this body, God will destroy me. I'm going to go to Christian Temperance Bible Hygiene. This is right at the beginning of the book. Page 10, second paragraph. Um, it says right at the bottom of the page, Men have polluted the soul temple, and God calls upon them to awake and to strive with all their might to win back their God-given manhood. No effeminate as we were just talking about as in Sabbath school study. Not going to be effeminate. To give back their God-given manhood. Nothing but the grace of God can convict and convert the heart. From Him alone can the slaves of custom obtain power to break the shackles that bind them. Do you catch that? Nothing alone besides our help that we would get from God can help us it is impossible for man to present his body a living sacrifice holy acceptable to God while continuing to indulge habits that are depriving him of physical, mental, and moral vigor. Again, the apostle says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. How? That ye may prove, or why I should say, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, 2. Now, same book, Christian Temples Bible Hygiene, and I'm going to read it off my screen here. It's quicker to get there. Um, page 186, paragraph 1. This is the part of Bible Hygiene. This is from James White. And he gives us these words The history of the human. Appetite is indeed a sad one. The Creator designed that the appetite should be man's servant, not his master. It was to be subordinate. So the Creator designed that appetite should be our servant, not our master. How many of us let our stomachs rule? Going on, it was to be subordinate to the moral and intellectual faculties. This truth is seen in God's first pro prohibitory declaration to man. Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for the day, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. 
Now, we're going to go to a manuscript. I don't do this often, but this was very pointed and powerful. This is manuscript 150, written in 1905, paragraph 6. We shall soon reach a time when we must understand the meaning of a simple diet. Now listen to this very, very carefully. I'm gonna, I have some demonstrations that I'm going to do here in just a minute for you that we're going to cause you to come back and think about this. We shall soon reach a time when we must understand the meaning of a simple diet. The time is not far hence when we shall be obliged to adopt a diet very different from our present diet. Now, when you study deep into the works of Ellen White, you will realize that she was prof they, her and her husband were pr practicing health reform and they began doing that in the 1860s to early 70s. This is 1905. So she was already practicing health reform. And she says, we shall be obliged to adopt a different, ver or a different, a diet very different from our present diet. So what possibly could be part of that? So I've done a quick Google search. Always, everybody goes to Google for everything, right? Google knows everything, except maybe spiritual things, but anyway. So I typed in this. Does food grade hydrogen peroxide kill fungus? Something that we've been looking at here for some time. Does food grade hydrogen peroxide kill fungus? Here's the results to that search, the top thing. According to the Centers for Disease Control, CDC, hydrogen peroxide kills yeast, fungi, bacteria, viruses, and mold spores. So the CDC believes that hydrogen peroxide will kill yeast, fungi, bacteria, viruses, and mold spores. And then on another website, that this is uh, um, Public Med, NCBI, and a bunch of other stuff there, um, .gov. And it says, the fungal threat to global food security. Fungi, fungi threatens the security of food supply to human populations on several fronts. They destroy up to 30% of crop productions. So, fungus has become a real problem. And as we've been reading about all of these things, and Ellen White just told us here, we're going to have to make some changes. So, for those of you that have joined us by phone, I will try to keep a verbal description of what we're seeing going on. Um, those that are by video, we have a extra camera set up that you'll be able to see what we're going to do here and I have a couple of quick demonstrations so the first thing that I want to do is uh, share with you here so what I have in these two little cups are hydrogen peroxide this is 35% hydrogen peroxide this is not the same thing that you get in the little brown bottles from the uh, pharmacy or a grocery store, this is a stronger grade of hydrogen peroxide. What I have here in my bowl are some mushrooms that came up in our greenhouse. And we did a little quick search um, about it and some tests and discovered this actually is an edible mushroom. It is not a poisonous mushroom. So, and I have in this quart jar some warm water. So I'm going to put some water here on the mushrooms. I think I'm going to break those apart just a little bit, just so that they'll all kind of sit down into the water. So we've got our mushrooms here. Now, what I'm going to do is, um, and this is something that we've actually started doing with our food, and I discovered this one by accident. Now remember, 
we just read, according to the CDC, that fungus, mushrooms of fungus, that hydrogen peroxide kills funguses. So what kind of reaction do you think I'm going to have when I put the hydrogen peroxide into the bowl with some water? So I put it in here like maybe to, you would say, rinse the mushrooms off. So let's go ahead and pour this in. Okay, I'm going to stick my finger in here and stir it up just a little bit to get it mixed around. And immediately, I have bubbles and a foaming action going on. And for those of you that can't see it as well, and, and all, all of you, my water just got a lot hotter. I've actually done this. this these mushrooms, being they came out of our greenhouse, don't have, they're not grown like commercial mushrooms. They came up on the aisle in the wood chips. In the wood chips. Um, if I were to have gotten some, if I'd have thought of it sooner the, about doing this demonstration, if I would have done um, the uh, um, mushrooms from the grocery store, I'd have had to have this bowl in a larger bowl because it would have boiled over the top. They get so hot. So, you can see though, the hydrogen peroxide, my point is with this example is I want you to see that hydrogen peroxide mixed with the water, so obviously I've diluted it thinner, it is bubbling pretty good here, and so it kills fungus. That was the point of that demonstration, that's all that we're trying to show you. But now I want to show you something a little more interesting. This is a bowl of split peas. I took these out of our cupboard just a couple hours ago to uh, put together this demonstration. So we've always washed. We put in water into our split peas and stir them around and rinse them several times before we cook them so that you know you're cleaning them before you put them in the pot. So let's put some hydrogen peroxide, the same amount actually I put in the other bowl, but I've, this is a bigger bowl and I've added water. So we got split peas with some water just covering the peas and I'm going to go ahead and add the hydrogen peroxide. Take a look at that. It's bubbling and boiling up big time. You can't even see the split peas anymore hope my bowl doesn't overflow. It's only four inches tall. And I didn't stir it or nothing yet. I don't know I want to stick my fingers in there. That's, That's reacted more than the mushroom. So that acted reacted more than the mushroom. Let's bring the mushrooms back over here. So the split or the mushrooms came out of the greenhouse. You could see the fungus, how much there. So how much fungus was on our split peas? Split peas? I got three inches of foam. By the way, the worst thing that that food grade hydrogen peroxide will do, if it does it, it I'll show you, it'll turn my skin on my finger white for, for an hour or two, but it won't, it won't even peel your skin or anything. But anyway, so my point is, and, and those, we didn't grow those split peas. We bought those from the store and We've been, actually, we've been washing them very carefully. And it, it takes sometimes a couple of rinses before they don't do up and I foam have, up like that. I have, gotten, I have gotten so that I rinse all of my legumes, all of my produce, and all of my um, grains in this because Mark was being set off by... You know, I'd, I'd cook rice, and one day he'd be fine. The next time he'd be a, a catarrhal mess, and I couldn't figure it out. But now I know some things are handled so that they grow that mold on them, and you've got to kill that mold before you clean, uh, before you eat it, or it's going to affect you. This this is really amazing. Um, this this foam, it's really. I'm glad it did this. It, let me bring it up in front of another camera so you can come in at it from a different angle, side angle, Matt. 
for them. You can see it's almost to the top of this bowl. We have it in a glass bowl. It's yeah, it's in a glass bowl, so they could see see it. I'll keep an eye on that. Might have to yell for some help to get it to the sink before it makes a mess of the room. Um, so anyway, you can see the the reaction with the Funguses. the fungus that's in our food. So now let me go back to this quote that I just read. We shall soon reach a time when we must understand the meaning of a simple diet. The time is not far hence when we shall be obliged to adopt a diet very different from our present diet. I believe, and why I did this demonstration is I, we've, we're coming to the conclusions that the fungus that is on our food because of how it is processed and handled is what's causing a lot of our disease and our health issues. So food, food grade hydrogen peroxide, cleaning it, well at least now the fungus is dead. Now you have to rinse it several times. Yes, we would rinse this, we would not just pour I it in the pot it. this it's way, this would get hot. rinsed in hot water several times till no more foaming action and and you know it may take half a dozen or more times but um, we're gonna have to take this bowl out of here it's gonna overflow if we don't um, it's within a half inch of the top now oh Matt wants me to hold it up again so and it's it's right up here Thank you, dear. Yes. <laughs> She'll add some water to it and calm it down in the kitchen sink. So, so let's go on. Testimony, original testimony number 17, page 191, paragraph 3. If ever there was a time when the diet should be of the most simple kind, it is now. Any reason? Question, why? We, we, we need a simple diet? Now, I would guess, and if I wished I'd had some mushrooms from the uh, store here, because uh, literally, they'd have been, we'd have had to have a big tray under it or something, because they'd have foamed clean out. I mean, I've done it in the kitchen sink, and literally, I was running water on it, trying to calm them down. The first time, I was like, what is going on? And the mushrooms got so hot, it burnt my finger when I touched them. There was that much fungus on them. So, growing things, obviously, your, ourselves, even though it's a fungus, didn't react near as much as those split peas that came from the store. If ever there was a time... When the diet should be of the most simple kind, it is now. Meat should not be placed before our children. And I would say, or any of the rest of us. Its influence is to excite and increase the force of the lower passions and has a tendency to deaden the moral or higher powers. Grains and fruits prepared free from grease and in as natural a condition as possible should be the food for the tables of all who claim to be preparing for translation. Now, I want to go back to Christian Temperance Bible Hygiene, and I want to go to page 8, paragraph 5, which is at the bottom of the page, and we're just going to go through a little bit of this and take a moment here with this. We are in a world that is opposed to righteousness or purity of character, and especially to growth in grace. Wherever we look, we see defilement and corruption, deformity and sin. How opposed is all this to the work that must be accomplished in us just previous to receiving the gift of immortality? God's elect must stand untainted amid the corruptions teeming around them in these last days. Their bodies must be made holy, their spirits pure. 
If this work is to be accomplished, it must be undertaken at once, earnestly and understandingly. The Spirit of God should have perfect control influencing every action. The health reform is one branch of that great work, which is to fit a people for the coming of the Lord. It is just as closely connected with the third angel's message as the hand is to, with the body. The law of ten commandments has been lightly regarded by man, yet the Lord will not come to punish the transgressors of that law without first sending them a message of warning. Skipping down near the end of that paragraph. To make natural law plain and to urge obedience to it is a work that accompanies the third angel's message. Ignorance is no excuse now for the transgression of law. We're talking about the health laws and the moral law. The light shines clearly and none need, need be ignorant for the great God himself is man's instructor. All are bound by the most sacred obligations to heed the sound philosophy and genuine experience which God is now giving them in reference to health reform. He designs that the subject shall be agitated and the public mind deeply stirred to investigate it. For it is impossible for men and women, while under the power of sinful, health-destroying, brain-enervating habits, to appreciate sacred truth. Skipping down, there are many who would receive the truths of God's word. Their judgment, have, judgment having been convinced by the clearest evidence. But the carnal desires clamoring for gratification control the intellect and they reject the truth because it conflicts with their lustful desires. The minds of many take so low a level that God cannot work either for them or with them. The current of their thoughts must be changed. Their moral sensibilities must be aroused before they can feel the claims of God. Kind of sobering thought. And I want to, I'm going to, uh, no, I'm not either going to go to that one. I want to go to our Bibles. Let's go to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. And I want to start with verse 8. Daniel chapter 1. And before I begin reading this, I want you to realize something. When Daniel and his friends, which I'm sure all of us are familiar with, Daniel, um, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, verse 6, um, these individual young lads, they were not the only captives that were taken to Babylon. There were many even of the Jews. Um, some estimates, some of the hist histories that I've read actually indicate that there were upwards to 10,000 young men taken of the Jews to Babylon. Now, I don't know if, if that's a true number or not. Point is, though, there's, there was a lot. So let's go now. These guys, these weren't alone. But interestingly enough, they're the only ones talked about here. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not, be, not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, 
who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. Then said Daniel to Melzar, not the prince of the eunuchs, but to Melzar. Daniel said to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. That was verse 11. Verse 12. Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. So, Daniel could have said, well, we just don't want the pork that's on the table, but, you know, the meat, the other meat, and the clean meats, and the, the vegetables, and the fruits and stuff that are on the table, we'll eat those, you know, and we, we really don't want the wine either, but, you know, can we just kind of pick and choose here and just eat? No, he said, give me pulse and water. Give me a very simple, plain diet. And let's test it for 10 days. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat, and as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So Daniel is saying, okay, let's give this thing a 10-day trial. And after 10 days, if you think that I'm and my buddies here aren't up to par, if we look sickly, talk about trust and divine power, he says, then we'll go ahead and eat what you want us to. So he, he consented to them in this matter and proved them 10 days. Now I can thinking, Mel, thinking Melzar is going, Heh, 10 days, that's not going to make any difference. I'm not, there's no issue here. I got nothing to worry about. At the end, at the end of 10 days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now before I go on, I want you to think about something here. Because, so, Dan, um, God gave Daniel and his friends knowledge and skill. Because he, they stood for his way. So you could really say it wasn't be that he ate his way to being brilliant. Though be because he chose the simple diet, God said, okay, I'll honor you. But also think about this. All these other individuals out there eating the king's meat and drinking the wine, they had become very, very intemperate. And now they are... Um, their intemperance is now showing. Verse 18. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in. Then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king commanded them with, or communed with them. And among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. So, diet made a huge difference for Daniel. Because Daniel chose and his friends chose to honor God, they knew what was right. Because they made that choice, God honored them. Oh, that all of us could have made in our youth 
made that choice. And those that are very young, it's my prayer that they made their choice like Daniel and his friends. Signs of the Times, February 11, 1886, and paragraph 2. Signs of the Times, February 11, 1886, and paragraph 2. Not only did these young men decide to drink, or dis, not only did these young men decline to drink the king's wine, but they refrained from the luxuries of his table. The food apportioned to them from the king's table would include swine's flesh and other meats pronounced unclean by the law of Moses, and which the Jews were forbidden to eat. They requested the officer who had them in charge to grant them more simple fare. But he re hesitated, fearing that such rigid abstinence as they proposed would affect their personal appearance unfavorably and bring himself into disfavor with the king. Daniel pled for ten days' trial. This was granted, and at the expiration of that time, these youth were found to be far more healthy in appearance than were those who had partaken of the king's dainties. Hence, the simple pulse and water which they at first requested was thereafter the food of Daniel and his companions. Give me just a moment. My nose is going to do its bad thing here. That's the result of my lifestyle and overeating and the fungus that I didn't do well with and protect myself. So let's go on. Signs of the Times, February 11, 1886, on to paragraph 3. It was not their own pride or ambition that had brought these young men into the king's court, into the companionship of those who neither knew nor feared the true God. They were captives in a strange land, and infinite wisdom had placed them where they were. They considered their position with its difficulties and its dangers, and then, in the fear of God, made their decision. Even at the risk of the king's displeasure, they would be true to the religion of their fathers. They obeyed the divine law, both natural and moral, and the blessing of God gave them strength and comeliness and intellectual power. Major difference made. God was able to bless them because they were obedient to his way. So as the time has come for us to draw closer to our Savior and to become more obedient we're having to become more careful so that we too can be overcomers. The history of Daniel and his companions has been recorded on the pages of the inspired word for the benefit of all succeeding ages. That testimony that we just read from Daniel is for us today. Let's go on now. This same article, jumping down to paragraph 7, that's Signs of the Times, February 11, 1886, um, paragraph 7. Our danger is not from scarcity, but from abundance. Our danger is not from scarcity, but from abundance. We are constantly tempted to excess, but those who would preserve their powers unimpaired for the service of God must observe strict temperance in the use of all his bounties, as well as total abstinence 
from every injurious, debasing indulgence. As I was studying this week, I ran across an article where Ellen White was talking about the diet. And she made this statement which rather surprised me. She said, since February, I believe it was when she was in Australia, she says, since February, the tomatoes have been um, producing here abundantly. And my diet has consisted from, from the time of February through July of tomatoes and bread. Crackers, she called it. Crackers. Um, so it was an unleavened cracker. An unleavened bread. That's it. With a little, she said, I sometimes put a little salt or sugar, which kind of surprised me, but I sometimes put a little salt or sugar on my tomatoes. There was no mention of butter, peanut butter, almond butter, or jam, or honey for the bread. It was just tomatoes and bread. Yeah, unleavened bread. How simple. From February... I have to admit, I, I'm, Melanie would jump up and down and say, yep, he's right. And that is, don't feed me the same thing two days in a row. I like a variety. There's lots of foods. And I, I don't get so picky about having to have a ton of food at one meal, but I love a variety. I love a variety of food and because there's so much out there that we can eat. So that was quite an interesting thought for me that maybe we should be, you know, I, I, I thought our diet was pretty simple. And then I read that and thought, no, I would say we have to, we eat pretty elegant in comparison to that. Though in comparison to the world, our diet's pretty simple. But we're not compare ourselves among ourselves anyway. So there's room for more simple. There is need now of men and women like Daniel. Individuals who are willing to have enough self-denial, because that's really what it's all about, self-denial, and the courage to be radical temperance reformers. Radical temperance reformers. Let's get super serious about this. Let's reform. So that we can present our bodies something more than a dead sacrifice, a dying sacrifice. Let's come up higher. Let every Christian see to it that their example and their influence are on the side of reform. As I was studying, I believe it was, it was either last night or this morning, I don't remember which it was, I told Melanie, I said, you know, I'm coming to the realization that cookbooks are a curse. That was this morning. That cookbooks are a curse. Because when we have a cookbook, we have a little of this and a little of that and some more of this and some of that and, and a couple of those and one of those. And it ends up being a mess for this recipe. And oh yeah, it's delectable. I grew up with a family that were fantastic cooks and the food was just amazing and we ate because of the taste instead of well all but one of us my uncle had no taste 
and he could sm- he could kind of smell, but he ate by how it looked. If it looked pre- appetizing, that was good food, but he couldn't taste. He had no taste at all. But the rest of us, we were all gluttons because we ate for taste. And I just want to encourage each one of us that we've got to make some radical temperance reforms if we're going to be walking those streets of gold. Radical temperance reforms. I want to go back to the beginning and finish with this statement. The need of healthful habits is a part of the gospel which must be presented to the people by those who hold forth the word of life. The importance of the health of the body is to be taught as a Bible requirement. A Bible requirement. Let us make a change in our lives that will allow us to gain that victory. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you thanking you, praising you for leading, guiding, directing. Help us to be able to be fully surrendered even in our diet what we eat, how much we eat, when we eat it. And guide us. Help us to be able to find foods that are safe to eat. And then we ask that you will add your blessing to it as we've done all that we can that you will make it something that will strengthen our bodies and not cause them to be feeble. But that we will be a strong people overcoming every inherited and cultivated tendency to evil. Draw us close to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.